but I'm going to do something really cool with you guys that's going to set you free. Probably in an area you didn't know you were in bondage in. Is that intriguing? Yes. Okay, you ready? Lift your hands and repeat after me. You ready? Yeah. I, I am not, am not God. God. <laughs> what do you think? Now, why is that so liberating to do that? <laughs> That's a nice snort there. That was a good snort. I like that. So why is that liberating? Because we don't have to be in charge. Yeah, Joan. That's right. But yet we do all the time, don't we? Isn't that awesome? Didn't you just feel stress go away? I'm not God. Hallelujah. I don't have to keep the world spinning. I'm not the one who holds my life together. I'm not the one who really even changes me because I can't change me. It has to be the Lord. My job is just to admit I'm not God and he is. And if I'm really down with that or up with that, man, great and mighty things happen. That's beautiful, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Father, we just want to thank you so much for just the freedom we have, Lord, to surrender to you in everything. And our prayer that tonight, Father, that you would speak to us in your word, that we would hear your voice. You are our God. You are our king. You are the creator of all things, Lord, and we trust you. God, with all of our heart, Lord, we refuse to lean on our understanding tonight that always gets us in trouble. Holy Spirit, we need your wisdom. We need your leadership. We need you to, within us, Lord, discern darkness from light, religion from a true passion for you. Father, may you have your way tonight and speak revelation to us, Lord. Beyond the words on the page, God, may the living word come and converse with us tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. You may be seated. And open your Bibles up. Nope, wrong. <laughs> Romans chapter 5. Yep. Turn to Romans chapter 5. And then once you're there, hold your place in Romans 5. And turn over to Hebrews chapter 2. And that's not where it ends. I know that tonight you were expecting the story of Esau and Jacob. That's going to be next week. There's something tonight that we're going to look at that we need to hear. Something that God wants to speak into our lives. Um that I believe is, is really relevant for us. And some of you really need to hear this topic. But keeping next week in prayer with that study as we look at Jacob and Esau and all that that story means, it's rich. You don't want to mess it. If there's, besides the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis, this, this two nations within a womb, wow, powerful story. So um, if you would, let's take a look at this. Hebrews chapter 2, and look with me at verse 9. It says, We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory to make the captain or the pioneer, that, that goes before us, the captain of their salvation, perfect through sufferings. Let's stop there. What went before our life was death. Suffering is a topic that is avoided many times because, hey, let's face it, who wants to suffer? Right? But through suffering 
we're being sanctified. We were made perfect on the cross. The finished work came through suffering, and we know that we're supposed to share in his sufferings. Now, I believe, particularly the Apostle Paul who wrote the book of Hebrews, he knew about suffering, didn't he? See, it's one thing to listen to somebody that lives in the ivory tower and has everything perfect and goes, gas prices, who cares about that? That doesn't bother me. Uh, what suffering is, but, but those who actually have went through suffering are going through it, and they talk about it, and they share it in a light of glory. Man, that's something noteworthy, isn't it? And the Apostle Paul knew a lot about suffering, because he, ever since he came to Jesus, his whole world was turned upside down, where he was rejected by his culture. Many historians believe his own wife, because he had to be married, being in the Sanhedrin. So clearly, he, he was rejected. And, and also, even God's people rejected him. Man, he was like the, you know, Freddy Krueger of, of, of Jewish culture coming out to destroy Christians. And yet, now he's walking up to their synagogue or their, their home fellowship talking about Jesus. I mean, he, he wasn't well-received. And so between being whipped, flogged, stoned, rejected, beaten, shipwrecked, I mean, the guy had just been through a lot. And, and I asked you to turn to Romans just as kind of a springboard about this whole topic of suffering. You know, as he writes to the church in Rome, who, take check it out, Rome knew a lot about suffering. I mean, you could be in certain outskirts and suburb areas in Asia Minor where persecution was much worse than others, but Rome, man, that's where Christians were like being eaten by lions, where Nero was taking them and treating them like candles and coating them with wax and hanging them up in his garden and burning them alive. I mean, Christians were going through suffering, you know? And he writes this. Look with me at Romans chapter 5. He says, Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint us because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Wow. Here Paul says that we glory in tribulation. Now, when you think about glory, what does that mean? I'm supposed to glory. Glory, that word weight, it means our substance. It means I'm supposed to look at this whole topic of suffering that Jesus endured on the cross that I might become a son and daughter of the most high God. And I'm supposed to look at this substance, this experience, this part of life called suffering. I'm supposed to glory in it. I'm supposed to hold it up of weight, of value. How in the heck do you do that? See, what we usually do is we grumble with suffering, don't we? It's kind of like the old proverbial Coke can that's shaked up. We see what comes out after you shake it up. A lot of Christians, you know, when times get tough and finances get tough and relationships don't work out or just something. I mean, it's so easy for us to turn into that Israelite walking around the desert grumbling going, God, why isn't things working out the way I want it to? We just do. But this whole thing and, and holding it in glory and in in esteem and weight of value, of treasure, man, suffering Man, it, it, like if someone said, hey, I've got this winning lottery ticket in my back pocket. I'm just waiting for somebody to come and ask for it. We would go, I want to glory that. I want to hold that in value. Wait, can you just drop it? I'll pick it up or just give it to me. I want to glory that. Well, God, I want you to look at suffering like that. How? Man. I mean, I, I just read that it creates you know, as we persevere through it, it creates this character and this hope, ultimately this intimacy and this heavenly perspective that just carries me through life. You know, I, I, I read that in my intellect, I get it. Okay, Dave, suffering, just to value it, lift it up, put it on a pedestal, look at it as a gift from God. I'm supposed to do that. And I get it. You're telling me it produces character and hope and all. I got that, but still, <laughs> How? How do I do that? I mean, intellectually, I can, I can write that out, but in my spirit, how can I really, truly go, that tastes good? 
How can I like James and Peter? These guys who, man, well, died for the most part in Roman suffering and being martyrs, really counted joy, really glory in it. And why is it so important? Besides the obvious way, right? There's, there's something more there. Yes. And tonight I'm going to tell you what it is. And either you're going to go, Dave, you're a lunatic. Are you going to go far out? This is liberating for me. Dave, I'm right now on the counter. This was my spiritual 4th of July tonight. This was my evening of independence from stupidity. And I was able to actually now glory in tribulation versus grumble in tribulation. How would you like that tonight? Then turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 3. And let's read how. I want you to understand that the dynamic of being able to rejoice and glory and suffering is an object of spiritual warfare. There is an attack against you and me trying to keep us from shining the light of God in the midst of tribulation and suffering. We are under attack. Um, indirectly, man, no doubt it, 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 there's demonic forces, but those demonic forces are directly using people things, places, keeping us away from really getting a hold of the common denominator that we need in our life to go, I'm in a glory and tribulation suffering, and I see why it's so important. I see what God is trying. Jason, I love what you prayed tonight, brother, about the sovereign hand of God allowing people, places, things, circumstances, all to drive us to a place of glory. I don't know if you heard that, but that was from the Holy Spirit tonight, what he was praying. You know, this attack, it's, it's exposed here. Let's take a look at this in Philippians where Paul writes and he says, My brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. In other words, hey, I'm going to tell you something. I don't mind being, mind being redundant, repeating myself. I'm not going to go, hey, I already told you that. This is so important. What I'm about to tell you here, I'm going to keep on repeating and being broken record because it's really important. That's a sign of a good teacher, isn't it? So what does he say? He says, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Beware of dogs. What's he talking about? Well, there was a group of people called the Judaizers. These people believed that Jesus was Messiah, but they also believed that you still needed to offer sacrifices, that you still needed to keep all the traditions and all the laws and all the Levitical directives in order to still be right with God, and they would come and follow the Apostle Paul wherever he went, kind of like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons are known to follow around evangelists throughout different countries. That's what they do. That's what the Judaizers did. They were following Paul around. Because he would come in like in the city of Galatia and just preach the gospel, man. Spirit living, grace of God, freedom, finished work. And they would come in to bewitch the people of God by adding on to the finished work, which you can't do. And they would come in and he called them, well, dogs. That is such a smack in the face. Now, why would he call them dogs? Well, you ever watched what a dog does? Many times dogs, they follow around other dogs with their nose up the rear end smelling. And here he's talking, he's paralleling a dog to a Judaizer that says, are you circumcised? It's like in slang, he's saying you bunch of crotch smellers. Seriously. He's just saying, you guys are wanting to look at each other to make sure you're, you're circumcised because if you're not, then you're cut off. You mess the whole point of circumcision. That's what they were doing. Paul's really getting brutal with them here. Talk about an insult. And he's talking about, and you see the context where he's talking about the flesh. No confidence in the flesh. Our confidence is not the removing of skin of flesh that we can do something. 
That's, we have no confidence in anything that we can do. This is so key to being able to glory in tribulation. See, that's the whole point of teaching us we have no strength in ourselves. We can't. And for some of us, that's really tough because, see, that's what's going on. The Judaizers come along and say, we know you gave your life to Jesus, and we know you're saved by the grace of God, but you still need to do this. You still need to add on this. And if circumcision was the biggest one. And Paul's about to stress and say, listen, if you want to be close with the Lord, if you want to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, if you want to walk in freedom from this world and be able to joy and count it all suffering on the cross like Jesus did, you can't have confidence in the flesh and do it. You can't. It doesn't work. Now, for some of us, that's really tough. Some of us are a little easier than others because, let's face it, some of us have more resources than others to throw at our problems. Some of us, well, we're a little sharper tool in the shed than the other person. Maybe more of an entrepreneur spirit where we maybe we troubleshoot problems for a living so we're able to fix things and we kind of pride ourselves in our ability to fix and resolve and reconcile. And if that's your gift, sometimes that can work against you to breed a confidence in the flesh. But don't worry about it because if that's the case, God has a way of even breaking you. The Apostle Paul, now he goes on to say, hey, listen, check it out. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Sounds a little prideful, right? It's not. Circumcised on the eighth day, the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Stop there. Let me have your attention. He goes on to say, man, you know, there's so many Jews running around, and, and most people don't even know what tribe they're from, from the captivity of Syrians. Only people, some from the tribe of Benjamin and Judah and a few Levites, but most people, they don't even know what tribe they're from. And, a lot, and all the other ones are Samaritans. We got a bunch of, I don't know who I am, and a bunch of half-breeds, but I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I had documentation of, of my birthright. I was a Pharisee. I was part of the Sanhedrin. I was for the Supreme Court, man. I mean, I was, I was actually commissioned to go out and just murder this sect and this cult. I mean, I was the guy. He's saying, if anybody's got a reason to go, I'm somebody, it was me. But he says here in verse 7, but what things were gained to me these things I counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all these things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Stop there. Now, I don't know if you noticed this, but Paul's saying he wants to gain Christ. Doesn't he already have Jesus? See, he already has Jesus, and he knows Jesus, but he wants to know Jesus more. We're going to read that in a minute. I want to know Christ, right? It's like an ongoing event of getting closer. It's kind of like people getting married. Hey, we walk down the aisle, we walk away, we're married. We are one, legally, spiritually, the whole deal, but we got a lot of growing together in this thing called intimacy, right? When people get saved, you might be saved. You might have the divine nature of God in you, but that doesn't mean that's the end of the story here on planet Earth. There's a whole journey of working out your salvation, your sanctification, I should say, with fear and trembling. And those that have confidence in the flesh, they're like Saul on the road to Damascus kicking the goads, trying to work it out on their own. It's really frustrating trying to live Christianity with confidence in the flesh. And there's all types of people around us like the Judaizers coming up while they were trying to say, have you removed the flesh according to the law of Moses and the covenant of Abraham in order to somehow be right with God? A lot of Christians are doing that too today still. When we say things like, man, I'm really struggling with this. It's almost like we're saying, I have the power to overcome this in of myself, but I'm having a difficult time doing it, but I'm working on it. We're having confidence in our flesh. 
Every one of us in this room have had difficulties, temptations, and strongholds, and bondage, compromise, and we say, man, I'm working on this, but I'm really having a hard time. What you're doing is you're believing that you have the ability to circumcise yourself. You have the ability to remove flesh from your life. And I'm here to tell you, you don't. You cannot. All we're doing is we're, we're taking the cross and bringing it next to an altar with a bull and a ram and a dove, and, this, and, we're, and we're mixing in the old covenant with the new covenant. Let me tell you what, Christianity is one big drag when you do that. It's seen in categories of Christians that one is walking in the flow of God's spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And others are looking and going, I want to be filled. I want, I, I've walked down the aisle when they've taught about the filling, the baptism, second blessing, whatever you want to call it. I just want it. And I go down, I get prayed, and I get anointed all, and nothing happens. I don't get it because the elders laid hands on me, and I thought that was the formula. It ain't. See, as a pastor in the body of Christ, I have no power to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And it is other fool that's going to tell you he does. He don't have no power. Only God has power. Okay? Alone. God and God alone. But we, we turn it into this system where we're turning it into work of the flesh. And it's just the opposite. True power, the ability to go, wow, I take joy in suffering. And the reason why, because through it, I learn, and here's the key, you ready? I can't do anything. You want to talk to somebody who's walking in the power and the anointing of God that just blows your mind that you covenant? You're going to talk to somebody who's come to the end of their rope. And they were, are you ready? Hopeless. Yeah. Helpless. Yeah. And then they were ready. That's what tribulation does. That's what suffering does. Some of you women feel your tribulation is your husband. At least most of it. Everyone but my wife probably. But you just go, I, I, I pray for him. I talk with him. He won't do anything spiritual with me, he doesn't go to church with me, he's just he's full of compromise, and I'm just at my end. That's because you're trying to change him. You're trying to circumcise him. You're trying to remove fresh flesh from his life, and you're acting like a Judaizer, like a dog. What are you doing? And you're grieving the Holy Spirit, the very touch in the hand of God that you say you want to move in your life and touch you. It's because you're trying to do a work in the flesh. You have confidence in your flesh to manipulate and motivate, and it doesn't work. And we do that with all kinds of areas of our lives. You know, John Stumbo, who's the president of the Christian Missionary Alliance, I, I listened to him speak at a conference last year. And if you ever get a chance to Google YouTube John Stumbo and listen to some of his blogs or videos, this guy is just so intense. I mean, he reminds me of Jeremiah that just is like the weeping prophet, you know. I mean, it blows my mind. And he had been pastoring churches for years, very successful, if you would, in Christendom. And he came down with this illness where he lost most of his body mass and in comas and just, and, and for a year and a half, no one could tell him what was wrong with him. He was dying, fading away, decayed. I mean, to like nothing of a man. His life was over and God healed him. Doctors couldn't explain it. He can't explain it to this day. Still don't know what happened, but God did. God took him to a place where John was like, I don't have any hope in anything I can do. I don't even have any hope in anything that doctors can do. I don't have any hope in some special drug. I don't have any hope in some special doctor. I don't, I don't have any hope in this body, that's for sure. There's only one place to go. That's why I love Corey Tim Spoon's statement. You don't know Jesus is all you need till he's all you have. Let me tell you what, the only thing that brings a person to a place where they can say that is the sovereign hand of God. 
No one can do it for you. Now you might go, well, okay, everything sounds right, but then what are you saying? That, that God brings some people to that place of helplessness, but some place he doesn't? No, I'm saying he brings all of us there. It's just some of, them, of us are humble enough to recognize it and yield to it, and others are not, and they're unwilling. You won't yield. Now, sometimes it's a process. It's kind of like the disciples. Check it out. I mean, here, you know, Jesus died. Everything's fallen apart. Their world has been turned upside down. He shows up, breathes upon them, says, receive the Holy Spirit. It talks about waiting in Jerusalem for this blessing. And instead, they go fishing and try and provide for themselves. That didn't work out too good. A little bit more frustration took until finally they sit there in the upper room and going, okay. Zebedee and Productions, if you would. John, Dad, you had a real famous business there. Even in the, the temple, they bought your fish, but now you're a heretic that followed you know, a false prophet, so your business is shot. And everyone knows us from following around Jesus because when he was feeding thousands and raising the dead and healing the lepers, we were proud to walk with him then, but now everybody knows us, so it's like our lives are in danger. We can't go sacrifice the temple anymore. We can't even walk into the synagogue. Everything's over. We're sitting here, and the only thing we have left is the words of Jesus. There is nothing else. He said he's going to send us the Holy Spirit to baptize us with fire and power. And he's going to send us out, and we're going to see people saved and redeemed. And we're going to walk in this anointing. That's all we have is his promises. There is nothing else. You ever been there? See, sometimes it might not be every category of your life that is just totally shot and leveled like them. It might not be like that. It might be just one or two. But that one area or two areas that have been leveled, so he can, you can say, Lord, unless you build a house, I labor in vain, so I'm not even going to do one brick. God, I need you to do this. And I'm going to trust. It might be that one area, whatever it is in your life, and you're going to trust. You're not going to reason. You're not going to justify. You're not going to manipulate. You're not going to self-motivate. You're not going to go to a Tony Robbins seminar. I think I can do it. You're not, no, you're going to just go, Lord, I'm going to sit in my hands. I'm going to trust you. You're going to do this. I believe God. I'm calling those things that are not as though they were. You're going to do it. And in, in that one area, but instead what we do is we go, well, I'll just put that in the shelf and I'll ignore that area of my life that's been leveled and it's a mess and I'll compensate by focusing and building with wood, hay, and stubble in another area. And then God comes and he levels that and you go, no problem, I got other options. And we keep on going and building in these areas and God says, I'll just keep leveling every one of them until finally you won't have any confidence in your flesh. And when you do, then you'll look at these areas of tribulation and suffering as a gift from God to tell you, stop trusting in you. Is this, is this reaching home plate? So let me tell you, the real key in walking in the anointing of God and the power of God's Holy Spirit is not prayer and fasting. It's not being anointed with oil. It's not memorizing your Bible. It's not going into the mission field. It's getting over yourself and stop trusting in you and really trust in him. Now, I'm not, I'm a big advocate of praying and fasting and anointing oil and studying the word and going, I'm just saying, I'm not gonna look at those things as a means to an end of being filled because if I am, I'm no better than Judaizers doing something in the flesh to get a result in the spirit, Right? I mean, we can actually turn prayer and fasting and Bible study into sacrifices on an altar. You ever looked at it like that? Because maybe you go, I don't understand. I pray and I read and I'm doing all the things, but it's not working. Mm -hmm. You see there? Now, when you humble yourself and you say, I'm not doing this to get something from you, Lord, because I realize there's nothing good I can do to get from you. Nothing. I'm doing it because, Lord, you did everything for me. And I love you. I love you. And I want to know you more. And I'm not doing it to get. I'm doing that what I've already 
forgotten will be released from within me. I'm doing it to remove layers and lies and resistance that cover over your hand from just pulling off the lid. Jesus stood at the door in the church, oh man, of Laodicea, didn't he? Not unbelievers, the church. And he's knocking, saying, will you let me in? He's knocking on the door of Christians, people who have the Holy Spirit, who have the divine nature of God, but they're, they've been bewitched, and they trust in the cross part-time, and they trust in their flesh the other part of the way, and it's a big mess. It's, well, it's called religion, is what it's called, and it's no fun. And how do you know you're caught up in that? Well, when tribulation comes, you don't glory in it. You don't rejoice. You don't count it all joy. You start to question your faith. God, if you love me, why? I thought I was special to you, Lord. Do you think you're more special to the Father than the Son of Man? No servant's greater than his master, amen? So the Apostle Paul breaks out the big guns here in verse nine. He says, I, I've counted all rubbish that I may gain Christ, verse nine, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Stop there. Wow. I want to know the power of his resurrection. Saints, how many of you want to know the resurrection power of Jesus Christ? How many of you want every day to be resurrection day? Singing hallelujah, there's an empty tomb in the Middle East, glory to God, and the same power that raised Christ from the dead has lifted me up. Thus, no longer do I say I'm struggling with sin. Man, I don't struggle with sin, I'm an overcomer. If I sin, it's because I was a bonehead and I chose to do it. But it wasn't because I had no choice or I didn't have the strength, because I had the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. But sometimes we get in denial and we lie to ourselves about the power that we already have, past tense. So suffering comes to remind us you're adding in to what God's already given you. Bad move. Stop. Release. Trust. Rejoice. And now he started off, brothers, I rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the guy that was in prison and beaten and flogged and shipwrecked and he's rejoicing. Why? Because he looked at these sufferings as a means to go, Paul, you have no confidence in your flesh. And that's why he walked in the anointing. That's why he walked in the God-given victory over sin and the things of this world. Because he goes, this isn't my world. That's my world. He said in Romans 8, I consider the present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed. What glory is he talking about? Well, if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, I know a man who was taken up to third heaven and shown inexpressible things. I can't even speak. Just keep that in mind next time you read a book about someone who went to heaven. When Paul went, he says, I can't even put it into words. I saw glory, and what I saw, it's not even worth comparing in the contrast. This suffering, that's nothing. I mean, we could say no pain, no gain. Let me tell you what. The pain we experience here is not even worth comparing with what Paul says we're going to experience there. Wow. And then, ironically, he goes on in that chapter to say, and because of these surpassingly great revelations that were so intense to keep me from becoming arrogant in my flesh and thinking I'm something more special than I am, God gave me a thorn in my flesh. Whew, some suffering. There we go again. More suffering tribulation and Paul says and I ask God you know the guy who just you know did all kinds of apostolic miracles God take this away many people believe it was malaria or eye problems from the eye salve he, he asked Timothy to bring all the but it was most likely in a physical infirmity as you read it in the original language he had this physical infirmity he's going God give it take it away and, and the Lord says hey my grace is sufficient for you 
Because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. As you see you have no confidence in your flesh, you see my power and strength in your midst and through your life. Paul says, got it. I get it. And see, some of us are like Paul with that thorn in the flesh, and we're so busy asking God to take it away when he says it's there to show you you're powerless to do anything. Now, I'm not trying to say we shouldn't pray and take authority in physical areas and spiritual areas. Paul was, but there came to a point where he says there's something bigger going on here than some temporal miracle. There's something eternal and value going on here in my spirit. It's called sanctification, and I see it. So I have to have to carry this thorn in my flesh like, well, maybe Jacob had to walk around with a limp after God knocked his hip out of socket after he wanted to wrestle with the Lord. Did he have to walk around and go, oh, it's not me walking, it's you walking, Jesus. It's, it's you, Lord God Almighty. What's your limp? What's your thorn? What's your suffering? What is it that God's brought in your life that instead of rejoicing, you're grumbling? Instead of surrendering, you're trying to resolve it and fix it yourself. And at the same time, time trying to have the spiritual life which you're not going to experience. Glorying in tribulation, it has value. And it's not that we're to be a bunch of masochists and like, man, I just want to flog myself and become some Epicurean type historical figure that if I whip myself and I beat myself enough, I can release my spirit. We don't want to get weird about it, you know. The point is, we want Jesus to have his way in our life so much so when people see us, they don't really see us. They see Jesus. I'm not God. I'm not God. I can't fix anything. I can't do anything. It's all him. That's why he gets all the glory. I pray that you hear this tonight and it just takes you to a place of surrender that maybe you haven't considered. I mean, maybe intellectually you have, but I pray that this is beyond your mind tonight. I pray your spirit has heard something something that goes beyond your intellect where you're going, I'm humbled tonight. I'm humbled and I'm convicted. I'm laying down my arrogance and my confidence and my spiritual gifts of how many people I've led to the Lord, of how many poor I've fed and sacrifices I've made and money I've donated. It's all rubbish. It means nothing. And if you can't grab a hold of that, then you're going to walk in carnality in your Christianity. It's as simple as a light switch. Come into agreement with what the Lord says and amen it. That's really our job. We're not here to do anything but as the 24 elders sat around the throne and heard the word of the Lord and they said, Amen. Father, we amen you. We're humbled that an almighty, sovereign God, creator of all things, would love us. We're so grateful that you don't grow weary and repeating yourself to us. We're so grateful that you're willing to level areas of our life that we might lift our hands to you. So Lord, whatever that area in our life is right now, we lay down our futile efforts and arrogance to resolve it, and we proclaim, God, that you're God and we're not, and we trust you. Father, we pray this for your pleasure, that you would have your way in us and through us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And every saint said, amen. Amen. Family, God bless you. We'll see you Saturday night.